So today we have a, a guest on the show, Chris Garrett's here. Uh, Chris, you're in San Francisco, right? Yep. I can just see the sun coming down on your face, and I'm just so jealous because I haven't seen the sun in like three months. It's so, just um, just coming through today. It's actually been pretty foggy over here lately, but oh, oh, it's I know nice. it's so hard being in California. <laughs> that you know, one month of rain. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, uh, welcome to the show, Chris. We're we're super glad to have a chance to talk with you. Um, you've been doing a ton of Ember work lately, and so we figured it would be just an awesome time to, to, to catch up on the latest of what's going on because Ember Conf is uh, right around the corner. And um, yeah, it seems like you have the inside scoop about all this uh, cool Octane stuff. So that's what we figured we'd talk about today. For sure. Um yeah, so I've been working on the next edition of Ember uh, and doing a series of blog posts on it. And um, it's really starting to kind of come together and really sh have this unified vision for like a totally new programming model in Ember. And I'm really excited about that. In fact, uh, there was a recent change we made today that uh, we've been talking about for the past week that is a little disappointing. Uh, we are descoping module unification and the file system layout changes from Octane mm. uh, because we, for two main reasons. One, we, it just wasn't going to ship um, in the near future. Like, it, we're looking at a more like six month timeline. And mm -hmm. that's because of template imports and all the changes there. Um, but the other reason, and I think really like once we started realizing that this was probably the better path to go down uh we realized this also like really cleaned up octane's uh learning story because now mm. octane is really it's not about like oh i'm learning a whole new file layout at the same time as learning like a whole new component model it's just the component mm -hmm. model it's updating your templates it's updating your javascript classes it's updating the way that you interact with the dom um, and it's updating the syntax, the, the language of Ember, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Really interesting. So one way that you talked about this in your um, blog post series, I think it was the intro post, was basically saying like the module unification stuff, some of the stuff on the build side um, is kind of like one area you could draw a circle around. And then the other stuff is more like the stuff you just described, which are like the APIs we use. Is it fair to say that that's like the runtime API of Ember and then you have like the build time API where the build time you can think of as like where you put your files and those kinds of changes versus like the actual runtime APIs that you're going to use and like the stuff that you've been focused on and the stuff that's going to be the bulk of Octane is going to be that stuff? Yep. I, I think that's actually a perfect characterization of it. Um, it is the stuff that is actually running in the browser and it's the way that you design that stuff. Like in theory, they're they're very orthogonal. Like you could have any file layout in theory if you had like the time to build your own Ember CLI, or there was like that Ember Webpack experiment that happened a while back. Like in theory, there's lots of options. Who doesn't have time there. to build their own Ember CLI? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I don't like reinventing <laughs> the wheel necessarily, but if you want it, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so maybe before, just uh, kind of before we get into some of the nitty gritty details of, of your post, because your posts do a great job of um, being a deep dive. And I think, you know, all of us who are using Ember day to day really appreciate the fact that you took time not only to explain uh, the details, but also to show the code examples at the end of each one of them. I think that's really good because it takes it out of like this abstract territory and tells us what is it actually going to mean for me as like a boots on the ground developer. But um, before we touch some of the those details, I thought it would, one question would be interesting that I wanted to ask you is like, you kind of already mentioned this, where you you are thinking about this in some sense as like a vision for a new coherent way to think about this stuff. And like, there's many people working on changes on different aspects of the of the ecosystem and across Ember's APIs. But you know, I know when when there's some projects that I work on and the open source community and you know you and i have even collaborated on, on add-on docs there's always like you have like these five or eight five to eight things that are kind of like moving but there's this point in time when the the doc generator lands we have pre-rendered we have version things and all of a sudden it's like the vision you have in your mind for what this thing is supposed to be like is going to be there and like you're working towards it but you know like once this this and this land boom it's going to feel great so 
I wanted to ask you because in the post you kind of are laying this out. Do you have like a specific, and of course it could be shared with other people working on, on core stuff, but do you have like a specific kind of, um, do you see like three months out, four months out, now is when Ember developers are going to be able to use all these things. It's going to feel much more, more coherent once these four to five things land. Is that kind of what's going on? Yeah, that that really is exactly what we're trying to achieve with Octane, with the, the additions concept. Like the idea is that we've been shipping all these new features one by one, getting them in there. But like you said, they're not, a lot of them are, kind of related and affect each other and you you can't really use one without the other but you kind of can so like angle bracket uh, invocation is a perfect example it's been around for a very long time now um, especially with uh, Rob Jackson's uh, polyfill I believe I was using it in an ember uh, like ember one app um, last year um, so it's been around oh, wow. but it wasn't uh, it it didn't have all cohesive. exactly. It didn't have all the bits and pieces that make it as nice as um as it is Early. in the examples that I've shown. Uh, so yeah, I right I, where you take you take basically a really complex component from something like an add-on or a project and switch it completely over to the new set of APIs. Right. And it's really only now or even in the near future that that's possible. Right. So most other major frameworks and libraries and whatnot, they'll release a new major version and that it'll have this whole new cohesive set of doing things, right? There's a ton of new features and whatnot. Usually when they do this, it is a mess of breaking changes. It is very difficult to update. Or at the very least, it's just like there's tons of bugs. People are like, oh my God, there's all these things that landed and like what's going on and everything's breaking. Um, Ember does not like any of those things. Uh, as a framework, we really want to make sure that upgrading is a very cohesive experience, right? Like not, not cohesive, it's a very smooth experience. It's very easy. Um, so that's the whole point behind like our, our Semver policy. We only remove features at major versions, but that leaves us in a place where we don't have the ability to have this big marketing like, oh, Ember 3 is out, go check it out. It's amazing. It has all these new features. That's what additions are. They're like almost like a fourth version number. Um, that is basically like the mental model has changed. Uh, check it out now. And you can see all of these new cohesive features together. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool because just thinking about like how <clears throat> at least like Ryan and I work on apps, both in our own own apps and also like consulting projects. We just yeah, we we stick with what's on the official guide site. And, um, you know, sometimes it's fun to use new features, but it's also like we don't want to use them until they're coherent together. And it's just going to make our lives easier and we know that there's going to be bugs to, to flesh out and stuff at the same time like the fact that our code base is on 3.4 right now even though we didn't really uh, need anything in particular it's just going to mean that upgrade path is going to be so much easier so um, it's not going to be like in the Rails days where like Rails 4 comes out and it's like okay we have to set aside a bunch of time and what does that look like we actually already know what the upgrade path is going to look like because we kind of do it regularly and it's typically a pretty easy process yeah um, so, um, you know, we're trying to share this mic here. We're not used to this because, uh, we usually have our own mic, but, um, uh, one other question I had for you, um, maybe before, before I hand over to Ryan, cause I know you have some questions after reading the posts, um, was about decorators because, uh, right. you talk about decorators and you talk about ES6 classes. And of course, all of us kind of, um, in, in the Ember land, especially who we've been around, for before ES6 classes were a thing and we're just used to the Ember object model and then you talk to someone who's kind of getting into SPA development these days and you realize like you show them ember.object.extend and then they're like what the heck is that man and you're like what do you mean dog it's ember.object like you don't know what that is and like no I don't and so it's like well okay yeah maybe it's about time to think about uh, what it would look like to get rid of that and so um, I know this has been like a passion point of yours um, maybe you could give all of us out there who aren't really uh, like familiar with uh, we haven't used decorators in any of our JavaScript code we don't understand the relationship between decorators and ES6 classes 
Um, and I know that there was like a meeting recently about like how far uh, decorators are in getting standardized into ECMAScript. So maybe you could just give us like a 30,000 foot view on all this stuff. Totally. Uh, so the first part, I want to I want to jump on something you said there. You said we've never used decorators before. That's actually incorrect. Uh, you've been using decorators as long as you've been using Ember. Um, computed properties actually are decorators. It's, it follows a decorator pattern. It's not a language level construct, but the whole idea of a decorator is that it's essentially a function that you pass something into, like another function in the case of a computed, and it adds something on top of it. It, it adds the caching and the invalidation logic, and then it returns that original function. That's all a decorator is. So native decorators... So it's decorating the argument, basically. Exactly. That's where the name comes from. Yep. And so that native decorators are just formalizing that pattern and making it a language level construct. And in Ember, we really only have a few decorators. We have uh, computed. Now we have tracked, which is coming along. We have observer. Uh, there's a few add-ons that kind of hacked into Ember's decorator system. Uh, Ember Concurrency is probably mm -hmm. the biggest one. Uh, Ember Animated, I found out recently, also. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely not something that we have ever considered public API, but, you know, mm -hmm. certain exceptions sometimes are made. Yeah. Point being, though, that we're, we've all been using decorators, and this is actually why it's been so long and such a, a hard process uh, for Ember to adopt native classes because native classes had did not have functionality that Ember needs. Like, we could not do the exact same things we want to do in Ember in native class land uh, without decorators. Basically, basically, we weren't willing to give up the, the ergonomics of the Ember object model um, until native classes had certain support for certain features. Exactly. Also it would make the whole programming model very cumbersome. Pretty much. It, it would have been very difficult. Um, there, were, there were just no ergonomic solutions. So the recent decision was a bit of a blow. Basically, uh, the V8 team was very concerned, and the Safari team, but the Safari team is always concerned from what I hear. Um, the V8 team was very concerned about performance of the Stage mm. 2 spec. And they actually had a good reason to be. Um, in our benchmarks, we found that the stage two decorators were a fairly significant regression from our, our decorator system. Um, and it was because they are very dynamic um, in nature. So the stage three-ish, like the, it's being called static decorators now proposal, the next generation of the proposal that's being worked on actively, it's definitely changing. It's in flight. I'm, it, it could change a lot based on what's coming up. And anything I say today is not at all set in stone. But the goals of it uh, so far are to be statically analyzable and to be performance driven from the very get-go. And it seems like V8 has been part of the conversation from the get-go. Uh, Little Dan has really outlined an amazing path forward. I think it looks great. Um, and they also are taking into account use cases from the community. It's very use case driven, including ours. Tract is actually one of their motivations in the, uh, the new proposal that is uh, currently PR'd on the proposals repo. Um, so what we just actually final comment perioded today in Ember uh, uh, RFCs is our decorator support policy. And what we're going to be doing is using the stage one version of decorators, which is very similar to the TypeScript decorators that have existed for quite a long time and that lots of other frameworks are using. Angular, MobX, uh, I feel like there's some Vue decorators out there. These are pretty well established in the communities like out there. Um, and they're also much simpler than stage two decorators, so they are fairly performant. Um, and there are some ways that we can optimize them to be even more performant. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's a solid move. Um, it, it does kind of suck. Like, we were kind of hoping we could hold out until these were a solid stage three, this is what it's going to be feature. But that's looking like it's another, I mean, at a minimum, and this is if every single meeting goes right, another six months away. And that 
It could be wow. longer. It could be a year. It could be two years. And this is where we've been. We've been waiting for years for this feature to go through the process, literal years now. So I, I think basically what we're looking at is a period of transition that is pretty code moddable, pretty straightforward, where we transition to native classes and decorators. And then after that, uh, sometime down the line, we will have a second transition period that will also be f fairly code moddable. Um, the, the invocation side of these new static decorators is still very similar to the existing syntax. So there will be some changes that need to happen, but it won't be like completely rewrite, throw everything out the door kind of thing. What's what's a like? Is there a, an example that shows a difference between a static and I'm, I'm guess dynamic decorator? Or are there any things that like you want to do with dynamic decorators that you won't be able to do with static decorators? So uh, there there are examples you can check out. Like I said, there's a PR open uh, for the static proposal in the TC39 proposals decorators uh, re repository. It's on GitHub. Um, if you search TC39 proposals, you'll see all their proposals. I follow them regularly. Definitely recommend nice. checking them out. Um, we'll, we'll link that in the show notes, too. Uh, so if you check out that PR, you can see some examples of what they're proposing. And essentially, what it, what it would introduce is a new keyword uh, for defining decorators, decorator keyword. And uh, a decorator statement is a, is a list of existing decorators. <laughs> and then... Uh, it, in decorator form, so like at foo, at bar, at baz. Um, the key thing here is that all decorators come down to like, I think three or four existing built-in decorators. And each of these decorators that's built into the browser can do one thing. So when you're analyzing the decorators, you can look at them and you can be like, okay, this decorator expands to these decorators, which so expands to these decorators. And these are the final like, actual decorators that are going on this field. And you can see like, okay, this is going to get wrapped. So Chrome knows like, this is gonna do this kind of a thing or a V8 or any other JavaScript engine. It can know that without evaluating the class. Before, decorators were just functions. They could do anything. There were no rules. So you kind of have to evaluate the whole class to know anything about it. And that that was a very expensive thing. Um, so the things that you won't be able to do that you could have done are mostly stage two decorators. Stage one decorators, pretty much like the use cases they're trying to cover are very similar. With stage two, you could do things like a decorator could decide to just add random fields to a class. Um, it could add initializers, which is just code that initializes in the constructor that just runs. It could add other hooks that run after the class has been fully constructed. Very dynamic stuff, basically. Like it could just kind of do almost anything. And yeah, it, it definitely was harder to like predict essentially what a decorator would do. I was gonna say, is there, is there any like Ember code that like you're like, oh, we can't do this thing now because we don't have these dynamic decorators? Um, no, not so far. Not Ember's decorators. Um, there may be decorators out there in the community. I can't speak for every decorator that exists, but out of Ember's decorators, we absolutely are covered. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So it sounds like from Ember's point of view, this is just going to move forward and very cool. Um, yeah, that's great. So like tracked, computed, yep. has yeah. many, all those things. Um, that's awesome. Um, and just to kind of explain maybe for listeners, like the relationship there, um, I guess, I guess we kind of already talked about that basically that you need something like a computed decorator to be able to write something like Ember's computed properties on a native class. Is that basically the, 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 the long and short of it? Right. Basically. Um, you need you need something that's going to intercept the class definition and be like, okay, this field needs to have caching and it needs, basically you're wrapping the getter and setter on the class with some mm -hmm. functionality. In the case of tracked, it's actually pretty simple. So maybe I can describe that. Uh, y y if you have a tracked property, it's a field that's on the class. So it's just, you can't, we don't have tracked on uh, getters and setters anymore. It's just fields. Um, mm, it's awesome. And 
what it does is it replaces that field with a getter that whenever you get it, it pushes its tag onto the auto track stack. Tag is just like a revision count. Um, and then whenever you set, it bumps that tag. It just bumps that number up. So then we check later on, like, hey, has anything dirtied? Has anything invalidated? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, something over here invalidated. Cool, we'll re-render that path. And um, yeah, it's that there is no way to do that without like object.define property. Um, right. Yeah. Right, which would be a bummer <laughs> if everyone had to write that. <laughs> Pretty much. That's very cool. Um, the some of the other other APIs I was just reading about were um, named args and angle brackets and this dot adders. Uh, this dot using this in templates to reference local properties. Right. Um, so those are those are actually all features that have already shipped, and uh, those are I think going to really clean up uh, templates as a whole, like. The way that, if you look at a, a template in a very large app with just curly components, it starts to get very confusing very fast. It's like, oh, there's just yeah. so many curlies everywhere. It looks like Lisp. It looks like a very curly-centric form of Lisp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. even even in our in our demos for some of our videos, like we started using angle brackets, and um, even if you're passing in like a contextual component and you render it like a list.item, but you put the at sign in front of it, it just is like, oh, right, this is coming from the parent. Like, you just know, as soon as you see it, I'm rendering in a contextual thing that I'm expecting to be passed in, so I don't have to think about, oh, right, list.item, is this like um, a local variable? Is it something that's in lexical scope? Is it a property on the instance, or is it an argument? Like, you just know it's an argument. Yep. Um, it's awesome. I was going to ask, are there going to be like any sort of linting rules around that? Because it would be cool if, you know, you could just say, all right, this is what we're doing now. You either have this dot foo, which is referring to a property on the component instance, or at foo, which is referring to an argument passed in, or angle bracket foo, which is referring to a component. And um, if you have a naked, just a curly curly foo, it must be in a lexical scope. So it must be like let yielded or something like that and otherwise there's an error so would there be a way, a way to enforce that i i think we well f there's a few different things that we would have to be checking against there i think we actually are going to be adding a deprecation at some point because it is deprecated for not using this dot so looking up things on your local context whatever um nice. that's a bit harder to lint against because mm. If not everything is um, it, it's hard to tell what is going to be resolved and how it's going to be resolved but mm. yeah because you could pass an argument in that gets set as a property that gets referenced in the template and anyone could basically do that right and then there's also things like uh, globals right like oh this uh, resolved like helpers for instance and uh, other things at that top level scope um, okay. I I do believe, like, if Godfrey hasn't submitted it already, he's working on the strict mode um, templates uh, RFC. And what that'll do is it'll set up templates in such a way that you absolutely can, because there are no global resolvables. Um, mm -hmm. So your app would break, basically. Yeah, everything is either imported or it is, which that kind of leads into, like, template imports and all of that or you, it is looked up on the local scope, or it's a local variable. And if it's looked up on the local scope, you we can lint against that, or we can throw an error against that. If it's a variable, right. uh, we're good. So that, right. that'll be get us into a place where we can statically analyze all of these things. That would be awesome. I feel like there's definitely been a, a trend in the JavaScript community in the last few years that's like, let's try to balance this so that we're not completely dynamic. We don't want to go too far the other way, but if we have enough information that like, a compiler can easily look at this thing we've just seen the benefits in the tooling side and it's just so worth it whereas like maybe four or five years ago we'd be like oh you have to just be able to say like hello first name like that's you have to have that api because it's so clean but now it's like yeah let's just 
there's three different ways this thing could refer to so let's make it clear yeah i i mean i feel like things oscillate between like uh we'd like a little bit more ambiguity we'd like a little bit more freedom to like uh that freedom got really hard to reason about let's go back to yeah. like a little bit more staticness um yeah i i definitely think that going back to a more static uh language at this point will help a lot though at least in my experience yeah. like you said it's so much easier to know like this is an argument this is coming from my component definition this is a component that i'm invoking this is a helper that i'm using i also think it'll become more uh a lot more useful as we start to like unblock more helpers and modifiers uh being usable in templates like i I'm not saying that we're going anywhere near like JSX or anything like that. Uh, but I do think that with template imports, it'll be a lot easier to kind of just define like a quick function and mm -hmm. have that be a helper that you then use for like just a little bit of business logic. Not even, let's not even say business logic, just a little bit of template logic. Like sure, sure. a little bit more than you would normally do because now it's much easier. I also, this also gets into like how I've been thinking about, um, template only components. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've been thinking of them as actually very similar to other frameworks, um, functional components. They are stateless, which is very nice. It that makes them super easy to reason about. And they are like very simple. In fact, that they're going to be way more performant than normal components because they have no class instance created for them with template only Glamour components. Mm. Um, yeah, like overall, I think that like moving that direction with helpers and modifiers and these template only components, you, you could see a world where you have a template only component, you have a couple functions that are doing like maybe just a little bit of logic, a little bit of mm -hmm. like what your computers would have done or modifiers like your lifecycle hooks. And you, uh, you have a, that's it. You don't have a class or anything right. else. Right. Um, I'm not, I, the, the whole like React hooks, like the, the direction they're going as a framework, it parts of it are really cool, but I am a little hesitant to dive all in and like every component should be template only, every component should be functional. But right. I do think like for your very small use cases, it's really nice. Right. I also can't help but think about um, Tailwind, the CSS framework that we've really fallen in love with over the last few years. And philosophically, there's something similar to what you're saying, which is that the idea there is instead of making starting out by making a, an abstraction for everything you want to style. So you want to style this thing, you need to come up with a name. It's like your um, your Twitter profile. Twitter. So you do Twitter underscore profile so that you can target that. You have a hook to target it with a class in a CSS class. And then you have you know your follower account so you have you have to name it twitter profile underscore underscore follower account so that you can hook into it instead with like utility classes you can just style the thing directly and then once you start using a button over and over again there's a path to extracting it out once you see the duplication or the complexity you can pull it out and it, it i just can't help but think of that what you're saying where you can start with just a template and you can go very far with these lower level tools modifiers um, some of the more um, the helpers that do a little bit more work and then even if we get that template only import stuff you can bring things in and maybe define a few helper functions and then once things step up from there you can make a backing class and, and get more involved with like did insert and will destroy and all that in service injection and stuff but whereas now you make a new component you always have con at least conceptually a component um, and a template and so you're starting off. It feels heavy. It feels sometimes heavy to just make a new component, whereas it should feel as lightweight as like extracting a function. So I really love Ex that. Exactly. I also think it goes in reverse too. Like you, you may have a lot of components that have like similar functionality. Oftentimes, stuff that you would have pulled out in, as mixins, and with helper functions and modifiers, we can start pulling that out into just like something you just use directly in the template. As opposed mm -hmm. to um, like a utility function that you have to hook up through JavaScript with a bunch of boilerplate. That nobody right. wants that boilerplate, which is why people still like mixins. Right. Right. Exactly. That's great. Um, yeah, we just uh, were messing around with uh, modifiers. You know, you wrote the post. Spencer made an add-on. Oh yeah, and, um, that was so great. We, so great, and we made a video about it, and it was really, really cool. Um, For sure. It got me super excited. Um, 
because you can just drop in like a tooltip modifier on like any HTML element and get like a tooltip rendered to it. And it's like, it's, you can't beat that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's really, really nice. Like I was kind of skeptical at first when we were going with Glimmer components and looking at the design and like Chris Selden was like, we shouldn't have lifecycle hooks. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> And he was like, yeah, they're, they're bad. They're, they just, they encourage bad things. And I was like, I, yeah. I, I spent a long time, I think I spent like a month on the design with him and Rob, just like hashing it out and really trying to figure out like what was the bare minimum we could ship. And we, we spent a lot of time looking at modifiers in that process. And we realized like, you know, most of these use cases, if, if not all of these use cases are covered by, um, by, modifiers or by mm -hmm. using getters more not even cleverly just like actually using getters a lot of logic that happened in like did update adders that we found was um like oh i'm gonna if this then i'll set up some state and it's like uh you should probably use a getter for that right and by getter do you basically mean like a computer property exactly um it's like the, it's like a value that's derived from state and a component already exactly um, Cool. So yeah, if you're listening and you don't know what Chris is talking about, he has a great blog post about modifiers and how modifiers plus Glimmer components, which are um, don't have like a Ember managed element at the root. So like right now when you render an Ember component, you get like an Ember managed root div or something different. If you change the tag name, it has like an Ember ID on it. <coughs> and um, also if you want to change the class of that root, uh, element you use like class name bindings and if you want to bind an attribute use attribute bindings all that stuff is going away with glimmer components and so you, all those apis go away because we already know how to set tag names and, and attributes we just do it in a template and um it also means that um some of the like what chris is talking about some of the lifecycle methods are going away so what are the ones that are going away uh so basically all of them um, there are two lifecycle hooks left, the constructor and will destroy. So setting up. So I'm never going to write did insert element again. You're never going to write it again. Um, you it's may crazy. write did insert, uh, the did insert modifier. So mm -hmm. that's part of the transition plan here is we have created a set of basic modifiers that, uh, cover the three lifecycle hooks for a modifier. So did insert, uh, did update or. or yeah, did insert, did update, and will destroy. So what, what a modifier does is it runs on the life cycle of an element. You apply a modifier to an element, and when that element is inserted into the DOM or removed from the DOM, you get the did insert and will destroy hooks. And then when any of the uh, arguments that you pass to that modifier, because modifiers are kind of like helpers, you can pass arguments to them. When any of those change, the did update of that modifier will run. The idea is like, okay, uh, you have like a add event listener modifier, uh, like uh, Jan Bustones, I'm probably terribly mispronouncing his names, but he wrote the Ember on modifier based on uh, some discussions he'd seen on the RFCs. And that, what that basically does is when it, the element is inserted into the DOM, it adds an event listener, which is the argument you pass to it. Uh, when it's removed, it tears down the event listener. And if that event listener ever updates for whatever reason, it will uh, remove and add that event listener again. It'll kind of cycle through that whole thing. So That's so cool. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, you could have a component that has a template, and then it says, you know, within your template, if you had a curly curly if is showing, and then you render like an H2 tag, on the h2 tag you could write a helper and as the is show is showing toggle boolean is toggling back and forth the helper on that h2 tag would actually be going through its entire life cycle even if the component was always rendered well so i modifier then the only reason i'm being pedantic there is because the helpers are a thing and it's they're oh similar, i, I, but I they're meant a to say different. modifier yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 i meant to say modifier so you have a if is showing h2 and then you have a modifier that you add in the h2 element that's like i don't know track when the user scrolled here and or fade fade in when you show yep. and um you can drop that on the h2 and then if they click something that toggles that boolean it runs and if they click that thing again it goes away even though the component is always there so like 
in before you had this level of granular control, you'd have to do like did insert element. You'd have to find that H2. Maybe it conditionally exists or not. So you'd have to add some logic there. And then you'd have to like maybe toggle a class if it's show. So basically, yeah, this is really cool because it just lets you get way more control over like the pieces of your template. And I can totally see how it basically eliminates the need for like all these lifecycle hooks. So it's pretty exciting. Yep. I have, I have a quick question just on, on Sam's example. Have you noticed that, you know, this will start to co-locate all the, the logic inside of the modifier? So you can imagine with like a component, I could have like my did insert set up three different things and then my will destroy tear down three different things. Is the idea here that you'll, you can move all this, this just into three different modifiers and everything's co-located? Yep, that is absolutely the idea. Um, and that is going to be huge for organization. In fact, that is one of the things that we saw as a ben massive benefit from React Hooks. And part of the reason why we were looking at that design so much in the design phase of modifiers. Um, we had proposed modifiers before hooks were a thing, and we've had modifiers in Ember for a very long time. But it was mm -hmm. also important for us to like make sure we were staying up to date on like best practices and other patterns in the ecosystem. And that mm -hmm. the similarities in like the goals and the effects of hooks and modifiers, I think, are very they're very. It's it's interesting that we both came to the same idea at the same time. Right. Right. Um, and even just the little bit of use that I had with Spencer's add on, which is like one implementation of some of the designs you talked about in your post, is that you have this kind of setup and teardown logic co located in a single function, um, in a single spot, and it makes it reusable and it's more composable than the patterns we had at, available to us with just components. Yep. It's like very, very similar. Um, and I think one of the benefits they keep touting is like this co-location of code. It's the, the ability to put things that are uh, concerned with each other near each other. And mm -hmm. I think that modifiers will really allow people to do that. I also think like at, at first it may not be as easy because without module unification and template imports, um, you, you won't be able to make a modifier specific to a component very easily. So if you have like, a video player component and you really need to like modify and uh, control that video um, you probably want to write a modifier just for that and it's probably not going to be used anywhere else so you, you probably don't mm -hmm. want to add one to the global like modifiers folder or whatever mm -hmm. but in the meantime like I, I think people will start to transition to that and template imports will probably land some time later this year and then mm -hmm. they'll be able to get that whole thing unlocked and it'll be great just throw a, a new modifier right near the component you're working on and import it and then boom you're good to go yep or in the same file like if we get to the single file world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very cool very cool um yeah it's interesting you mentioned react hooks i definitely noticed a lot of similarities there um one question that i had for you earlier since you are so familiar with decorators and es6 classes and what it needs you know all the work that's been going into them obviously like Yehuda has been a big advocate on TC39 and in the de design discussions. He's talked about this over the years that, you know, he's always wanted the ES6 object model to get to the point where Ember can use it natively. Um, and, uh, you know, with React hooks coming out, React's kind of taking the position that they don't really care about incorporating ES classes into their programming model as like first class citizens. They're kind of actively discouraging their use. Um, the, the primary design goals of React Hooks were to help co-locate, set up and tear down logic and offer more composability than were available with just uh, components. But they also have mentioned that they think classes trip people up, that the this instance and the this, the, 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 um, the this keyword and um, binding and, and all this stuff context trips people up. So it's, it's a good side effect of going hooks that are just functional um, to get away from that. Ha, ha, what do you think about that? Ha, has the core team talked about that point? Is it a problem that a player as big as React is no longer interested in moving ECMA classes forward? Just curious to get your thoughts on that. Um, I I think I don't think it's really a huge deal that React isn't trying to push classes forward because there are a lot of other frameworks that are. 
Um, and there definitely is buy-in here. Like the fact that we got feedback so fast for state for for the static decorators proposal, I think shows that like there is demand for this. Also, for decorators, uh, future functionality that will probably be coming down the pipeline will be function decorators and other decorators that parameter oh, cool. decorators, things that you know they might be interested in. So I, I think decorators right. will get over the line. Um, nice. And that's that's really the last piece of functionality we need. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried honestly about the future of classes as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, now, as to whether or not like they actually are a good pattern, um, I tend to like to iterate towards things. Um, I, I like to not just kind of jump off a cliff, if you will, uh, with the crowd. Um, right. I think React is making a very bold move going this direction, and like I am very interested to see how it plays out. And I, I definitely see the, the value of Hoax. I see the composability of it. I think like it, it looks pretty interesting, and I, at the same time, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking like of a million different ways that you could make some really trippy logic through those hooks. Like, right, just as hard to follow as a class. Like. JavaScript, to me, has always been a language that if you try to push it too far into one direction or another, you end up with just a mess. Like, it is not your perfect functional programming language, but it's also not your object-oriented Java language. It's not mm -hmm. any of these things, unfortunately. Like, yeah, if we could redesign it from scratch, we probably would have done a better job. Mm -hmm. But we're here now, and I think, like, a mixture, a healthy mixture of like the different concepts and uh, patterns in JavaScript is generally good. And that's where even things like I, people might, certain people might disagree with me, but like I even think a mix-in pattern is useful at times, not yep. Ember mix-ins to be clear. I hope that there is a, there's a mix-in uh, proposal going through TC39 right now. And I actually hope that that makes it through. Um, cool. So we can have first class mixins. Um, oh, Ember mixins cool. are a whole different thing, and they definitely need to go away in the long run, um, <laughs> one way or another. Uh, I think, personally, not not yep. the views of all the core team, but just me personally. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I I am interested to see how it plays out in React land. And for Ember, like I said, I think. I see template-only components as our way to start moving towards experimenting with more functional patterns. Mm -hmm. um, between that, between helpers and modifiers, and uh, certain ideas we have for helpers and modifiers, I don't know if you noticed in that post, but we were injecting services directly into helpers and modifiers, a way to access long-term state from mm -hmm. your uh, template-only components. So they say purely functional. It's kind of like use state, solve similar problems, but it's mm -hmm. not creating this random state bucket in the middle of nowhere. It's like a centralized place. Right. Um, I think we can start to experiment with that, start to play around with patterns, and really just start to like actually emerge patterns. Like I, I think it's not a good idea to try to, like I said, just go in a direction and push hard. I, I, I want to see the community actually play with these ideas and develop them to a point where we are very confident that these are the solid patterns that we want for the future. And then yeah. we can start adopting them in mass. And if that ends up being like, everything is template only or everything is completely functional, sure. But I, I don't imagine we'll be that way in like a year or two. That right. Might, might okay. be several years down the line. Right. Ryan's got to grab the mic for me, even though I have like a hundred things to say. Here you go, Ryan. I'll try to remember all my things. Well, on the um, you know the experimentation is that sort of some of the thinking behind these uh, the component manager and the modifier manager that we've seen recently land? Absolutely, I think that those are those are about a lot of things. One of them is just like making sure that we can evolve the APIs that we have um, and we set up the infrastructure to do that. Another one is I've actually been thinking about is it's actually a perfect way to get people involved. Like once you set up the manager, setting up like the implementation you have in mind and specking it out and being like, hey, can anybody implement it? That's actually much easier um, than like being like, hey, do you want to dig into Glimmer VM and figure out how to do something? <laughs> um, so really, that's a great point. That is, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even just the fact that 
we were already able to install an add-on and make modifiers, even though the team didn't have to decide what the final modifier API was. It's great. Yep. Um, I, uh, I think we, we're generally, like the, the core team is generally moving that direction um, for basically everything. I think the single file uh, components primitives and the template import primitives is like another example of something mm. where it's like, let's experiment with this. Let's try things mm. out. Some people really like one syntax. Some people really like mm -hmm. another. Let's see what everybody likes after actually using it for a while. Right, right. I really like what you just said, um, you know, about not kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater and not trying to get everyone on board with one new paradigm, um, you know, immediately. I think um, we've seen this a lot in other communities, you know, Ember kind of, you know, maybe Ember started out trying to do a little too much. Um, with all of the different roles for the objects, you know, covering everything from, you know, routes and singleton controllers and view and component instances and even a data layer with an identity map and an adapter pattern to talk to any backend. Like, I think in retrospect, a lot of the folks who's worked on Ember would say, you know, we want to get to those high level APIs, but we actually need to kind of do what we're doing now, which is start with the lower level stuff. Um, at the same time, I'm really glad to hear folks like you and other people on the core team continue to, to espouse the view that um, we do believe that basically if 95% of people are doing something, it means that we should have a well-defined role or boundary for that thing. So if 95% of people are fetching data um, for an initial render, we should have a model hook on something called a route, as opposed to saying everything's just a component because in other communities, people will say that. People will say, this is beautiful, everything's just a component. But, you know, they also say, oh, you know, JavaScript has objects and arrays. Why do we need models and collections and ORMs? Yep. But what you see is that while that is kind of beautiful in some sense, um, people do end up doing 95% of the same thing. And then several years of experimentation later, you see higher level tools like Apollo or Redux come out. And it's the reality is that objects and arrays aren't quite enough to, to make it easy enough to do things or just components aren't enough. You do need something like uh, providers and, and context to solve other problems. So I've always been really glad that Ember has like admitted this aspect of its programming model and said, if we have if we need global state, we're going to have something called a service. And that's going to help us all talk about global state and when to use a service and when not to use it as opposed to saying everything's a component. Of course, you can use a component to make global state. Just use a component. We have components and they can do that. So I think in the same way, what you're talking about really makes me excited for having more um, roles, more objects with specific roles in the system where we can say, oh, actually, you shouldn't use a component here. You should use a modifier because the kinds of things you were doing with these components and the kinds of things you were doing with those components, those are actually two different kinds of things. And um, now you can use modifiers for one and components for the other. Yep. Um, I was even thinking about this, like, because I've been doing the Ember animated stuff, and Ed has been using this kind of um, convention where, you know, we have the angle bracket components now, but curlies still work. And curlies are very good in a visual sense of differentiating control flow from things that, like, render elements. So curlies aren't going away for, like, if and each, right? Those are control flow things. So then the question becomes, what about something like animated if, which is technically a component, but doesn't render anything? And so Ed, in his uh, docs for Ember Animated, will show like uh, animated if, or animated each with curlies, and then rendering components with angle brackets. And it looks great. It looks like really good. And, you know, we've talked about like renderless components before and components that only yield and don't render anything. Maybe they're like a form provider. And I was just thinking maybe one day Ember is going to have like renderless components and, and regular, com like they're going to be called something, but it's going to be like a renderless component. And it's just going to be a subset. It's just going to be a certain new kind of thing. And if you want to make a, like a data provider, something that's not rendering DOM, it's going to be different than other kinds of components. So um, you could totally see that happening one day where it's just yeah. like the kinds of things you want to do in renderless components are going to be easier because we're going to have a role for it in the same way that like services are, are easy because there there's APIs defined around them that can be injected. Like it's just very easy to do all that stuff. So Definitely. Um, that's, that's the part that I like about 
you know, when you're talking about everything is in React, they're kind of going towards this model where everything is a hook. And um, there's going to be patterns that emerge. And it's amazing. Like, it's it's amazing that you can give low-level flexibility and you can see the, the explosion of creativity in the ecosystem. But eventually, um, certain patterns filter up. And, um, you know, Ember takes a slightly different approach where we're trying to kind of filter those things up more together so that no one feels like, oh, I chose flux and it was the wrong thing or whatever. Right. Um, so um, I think this is just, a, it's just an interesting needle to thread. How can we get experimentation and enough excitement and, and um, flexibility where people can actually solve the problems they have while still ending up with something that everyone can use? And like, you know, 90% of Ember developers are on the latest version and using the latest tools and stuff. So. Um, I really just like, I, I like that, how you broke that down. Yeah. Um, Stability without stagnation. That's what yeah, we're, exactly. we're aiming for. Really, really, it's true. Um, and yeah, I mean, with this Octane stuff, it definitely does not feel um, stagnant at all. I mean, there's so many cool things. And like you said in your blog post, it doesn't even cover them all. Um, but I think it's going to feel like, you know, in, uh, six months to a year from now, it's going to feel like a, 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 a new ember, uh, even though it will still feel familiar. Yeah. And um, it's just going to feel more pleasant. All the stuff that kind of bothers us as like people who have been doing ember apps for years, it's just going to feel way better, I think. I, so um, The more I play around with these uh, new features, especially writing this blog post series, it really helped to clarify like how much better things are going to be. Tracked properties are one of those things that you're like, oh, it's not that much different, right? Like it's just a little bit less annotation, but it also like just doing that reversal of like I'm tracking properties rather than writing getters with dependencies. I'm tracking the things that can change and that can affect the DOM when they change. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, all of your classes are so clear. You're like, okay, mm -hmm. these are like the five things that can change. Everything else is either business derived logic, from derived mm -hmm. from it, comes from an argument. And it just it just makes things so much clearer. Like overall. That's so cool. Very cool. Yeah, well while well we're while well we're on the, the track properties, one of the like just kind of mind blowing uh things from your blog post is you, you talked about how sort of how like you can make code more readable and one of the problems with with ember.set is it, it is it causes your class definitions to leak out all over the system and that goes away when you use tracked um, right. so i'm wondering if you can just expand on that and and um yeah i'd love to hear more of your thoughts on this so the thing about ember set and get is anything in your system is observable like you can be like oh, i have an object here i'm going to uh, watch any key on that object um, and I'm going to then set it later and that'll let me know because I watched it earlier that'll let me know that things changed that means like you don't have any well-defined schema you don't have any well-defined public API it's whatever like anybody can put any state anywhere they want and it's the wild west I've seen this in ember apps that are very large and like have grown to that kind of sprawling size where like every app does really at some point like i have grown to that size where you can't really understand the the whole app and people just start putting state all over the place um i think this problem got compounded though by like the fact that you could just have arguments on a component for instance um just be properties that are set directly on the component that you didn't have like a class definition where you saw what all the properties would be, people kind of just got used to this idea of like, I can put anything anywhere. Um, and with the changes we're making, they may feel a little bit restrictive because of that, but they also lend so much clarity when you're looking at these classes. It's like you were saying like, oh, that's an argument. Oh, that's my class instance. Like, you know exactly where everything is coming from. And tracked is another form of that. Like, you know exactly where things are changing. And if anybody tries to add something that uh, changes elsewhere, they, they can't. It just won't work. Yeah, I think I think that's really awesome. I, I was just reminded of, like, I don't know, one of the these videos or refactorings we were doing on Ember Map, and I was, like, refactoring, like, our video player, which had, like, was using send action up until like six months ago or something and it had like an on end event 
and like an on play and the on pause and like one of them i just missed i like switched it from like send action to you know this dot get on end and invoke it and like one of them i just missed and i think we had two of them at the top of the component where we just do like colon null to mark it but the third one we just didn't and it just like didn't work when we pushed yep. it um so i love in your post it makes it really clear where you see at the top you basically see what's tracked and you just can look at that and say oh right like what is the state flowing through this component um and what how is it changing over time these are the things i need to think about um it's really cool really cool yeah it's one of my um, favorite features I, I think track properties are going to be amazing i also really want to see how um at some point we've talked about opening up that auto tracking api so that you can put things into it that aren't just tracked properties so this might be very useful for instance if you want to use like a native proxy um a native H javascript proxy are, are you guys familiar um i don't know so do you know like Ember proxies, like unknown property, yes. set unknown property? That's basically, native proxies are basically that, but built into the browser so that when you do foo.bar, it goes through your proxy. So it's like method missing in Ruby kind of? Basically. Uh, there are some differences and restrictions and things are gonna, they, they aren't gonna play very nicely with private fields. Uh, okay. But basically there are some use cases where they make a ton of sense. like. Ember M3, which is the data layer we've been working on at LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. That um, data layer is all based on, you know, uh, having schema-less APIs. Mm -hmm. So not having model definitions, but having like a, a kind of a, not, I guess technically it's not schema-less, it's model-less APIs and you have a schema. Right. The schema is how you interpret your API from whatever your API responses are. Um, so with those models, um, you, you don't Basically know at, what... At, you don't know at, at the time the programmer is writing the code. You don't know... Uh, well, the, the, the programmers know, but the reason... So the reason why you don't want to do this is be, you don't want to have model definitions is because um, at, in a very large app uh, yeah. is because they are very expensive. They mm. are a huge chunk of code that you have to send to the browser. So what you want is to be able to like know that you have a model, but not have to send any code to the browser that has to know about that model. It can just know like, oh, all my models have keys and values on their JSON, right? And this is how they set them up. And this is how you interpret it. And then you have some tooling that helps you like catch, like when you're in development, like, oh, that's supposed to be a person model. Don't, don't set other things on it, right? Um, anyways, it's, it's kind of similar to like the same concept behind uh, GraphQL and like why you want to just have um, like minimal APIs that you're communicating. But anyways, point is, uh, so you don't know these fields in advance mm -hmm. and you don't have a class that's defined for them. So what you want is something that can intercept every time you interact with the model and be like, oh, you're interacting with the model, you're loading this key. Okay, I'm gonna track that key for you. And so we need an API to do that. Um, I also think it'll be useful for other things in the future. So I'm I see. excited so about that. It's a way to get the benefits of tracked um, in situations where you don't have the class on a file on disk and you're marking specific properties. But um, basically that the concept of, of the track decorator could apply in those situations too. Yep, exactly. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, I haven't used tracked yet. I, I think we played around with like a glimmer demo like two years ago and, um, but I haven't used it yet. So I don't actually know what it feels like to use track. So, um, I'm excited for that. Um, so what is the status of, uh, of glimmer components? W w are those going to, those are going to be part of octane? Absolutely. Um, in fact, those are probably the most complete out of, uh, all the things at the moment. They are, uh, V O 14 three alpha three or something like that the only reason they're alpha is because of glimmer js compatibility uh we had to do a few things that were waiting on uh features basically we need modifiers in glimmer js mm. uh to actually be able to release v 1.0 of gl glimmer components but we are not planning any breaking api changes for ember users you should be able to go and install that and play around with glimmer components today very cool now, 
can glimmer components do everything glimmer components plus modifiers plus the kind of octane suite do everything ember components can pretty much um there's like a few edge cases where uh you would have to get a little creative basically did render it the the functionality of did render and did update is they they rerun anytime anything in the component changes which is incredibly expensive mm -hmm. first off and second off it's not how modifiers work modifiers are only changing in response to their arguments changing um, so you, you don't have that same functionality. Mm -hmm. So there are two ways around that uh, that we thought about, and this is the reason like we, we thought this through before we made this decision. Mm -hmm. One would be to define your own custom component manager that is literally just a render detector or something along those lines. And that if you really need to like detect any render change in the subtree, cool. That is isolated in a single component that you are opting into that cost every single time mm -hmm. um, the second one is also just to use the dom or use the uh use the leverage of the platform use a mutation observer mm -hmm. that you can watch the entire subtree of a component or of right. an element rather right so dom, um, right. and you could create a modifier that does that so it's not you don't have like a one-to-one -one functionality here right you, you can't just be like oh my did render i update that to a did render modifier it doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't really work right. but all the functionality is available in one form or another. Like you will be able to port every um, every component, and ninety percent of the time, ninety nine percent of the time, I think it will be a pretty straightforward port. Right. It'll be better. It'll end up being better code. I hope so. <laughs> so does that? Do you know if the guides are going to be recommending only Glimmer components? I mean, that's part of the model. It's just Glimmer components. So uh, I've been actually working on that this week, and we are just putting Glimmer components as the mainline thing. That's we awesome. will have a section on classic components that kind mm -hmm. of just, for people who uh, know Glimmer components, here's what a classic component is, how you use it, because there will be interop for quite a long time. Right. Um, we imagine. I mean, right. these types of migrations take a while. Right. Um, so we want to keep that around, but it'll also be like kicking you back to older versions of the guides if you want more in detail kind of things, which is the whole point of having version guides. Right. That's so cool. I mean, I can't wait until you go to emberjs.com, click guides, and you see, yeah, glimmer components, you see angle brackets, you see modifiers, um, track property. It's all really going to be really cool. I'm also super excited for the new website design. I think that that will look amazing. Like it, it really looks beautiful. So I'm super excited for everything this year in Ember. Like this yes. is Ember. This is definitely like what we've been building for uh, towards since the early 2.0 days. When, like, I feel like back then things definitely felt like they weren't happening. Like. Mm -hmm. The angle bracket components RFC happened and it was it didn't work out like mm -hmm. we were going to ship them in 2.0 and then we didn't. Things got delayed. We had the glimmer rewrites like it, it took time. And really, the core team took its time and stepped back and realized, like, you know what? We need more design work. We, we mm -hmm. can't just rush this. Mm -hmm. We need to, like, solidify it and make sure that everything everything really will be solid and i think that all that work is paying off now like i mean yeah totally the fact that again like you already said the angle brackets are shipped at named arguments have shipped um i mean all all the stuff that's going on it's like every minor version has something great that's new and um so yeah i think it's definitely paying off and it shows so yeah. awesome well i think that's a, a good place to end it uh chris thank you so much for your time coming on dropping some knowledge bombs on us that was um that was very exciting. Uh, I can't wait until Octane comes out. Can't wait to see everyone at, at EmberConf and talk about all this stuff and, and hear um, the polished versions from all the speakers. I think it's going to be super exciting. So, um, yeah, thanks again for coming on. Absolutely. And, um, Thank you for yeah, having me. Absolutely. Uh, if folks want to kind of uh, follow your work, your your writing, so you you got a blog now that's relatively new. Where yeah. should folks find find you? Uh, Twitter is generally where I'm at. Uh, Zurok is my handle name with a P Z U R A Q, um, and yeah, if you if you see that handle anywhere, it's probably me. Um, <laughs> and then I've got my website www.zurok.com. Um, I am gonna be trying to post uh, once a week. Like I I generally think like as annoying as it is, visibility in the blogosphere for 
like technology is super important and we yeah we have some awesome posters in the community and i just think we need like even more to yeah be honest. totally well yeah. it sounds like you've got a lot to talk about too because you're involved in all this stuff and no i mean just from a perspective of someone who's not doing core open source work it's always great to see these updates and it just reinstills your 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 faith in the machine that's moving forward because so much of the work does have to happen in these long design phases but just to see the process exposed you know it's just like consulting like it just it's it's like a faith booster big time and it's just also very exciting so we appreciate that totally yeah, and the the high the bandwidth the high bandwidth of those posts is just you know you you can capture everything that's in the discussions and the rfcs and it is it is the best way to learn about all this octane stuff okay i will keep it up i will try please, please. <laughs> awesome man. All right, well, hey keep up the great work uh thanks again for coming on thank you for listening and um we'll see you in portland and we'll see y'all next week <laughs> i'll see ya all right bye